are you happy? We had a great time last night. That was a lot of fun. You know, I've been all around the world conducting choirs, 500 singers or more, and I'd like to say that last night was one of the best choirs I ever sung with. I mean, I'd like to say it. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. No, I just had to do it. No, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm happy also to be here, third session on the five-year plan. And when I say the third session on the five-year plan, we should, we should have the 20th session on the five-year plan. Wouldn't you agree? And so I want you to view these three days not as a course on the five-year plan, but rather three days of an introduction to the study of the five-year plan, which we are going to be doing for quite some time. And as I said, there's more material in this program that I'm giving that we'll make available to you. If you're on the email list of the school, we'll send you a message when that's there. But I want to mention something that kind of interests me. When I was first growing up, my favorite TV show when I was a little kid, I was like eight or nine, I can't remember, there's this TV show called Mission Impossible. And it used to come every Thursday night, so I don't know if you remember, I remember what time. And I used to sit down cross-legged, you know, as a little kid, and I couldn't wait for, I, I would sit there, you know, like half an hour before, just waiting for the show to come on. And I loved that show, for, so I don't know why. And it always, I don't know why they called it Mission Impossible, first of all. Because at the end of every episode, they always, you know, achieve the mission. Okay? They should have called it Mission Possible, but really hard at first, or something like that. But that probably wouldn't have been a hit title or anything. But it always started out, they would play this tape, and this tape would have this really long, involved, complicated mission that was of great importance to the world or, or something like that. And they would play this tape, and they'd say, this is your mission with you and your team have to do it. And then the tape would self-destruct, <laughs> you know, and it would self-destruct. And I love this. And I, I was thinking as a little kid, you know, oh, they got this mission, and how are they going to do it, and so on. And it really excited me. And when I read the five-year plan, I kind of feel like that little kid again, that we're given some special mission that we can achieve. And you know, when the, when the tape self-destructs, you know, that's not the same, because the, the five-year plan you know, message isn't going to self-destruct. But in a way, when that tape self-destructed, it meant that they were the only people that could fulfill the mission. Isn't that right? When it, the, the, in other words, nobody knew what the mission was, it, that you were told it, you had to do it. And that's still the same. We're the only ones that can fulfill this mission, and it's given to us. And, you know, it's kind of fun. I, mean, I, I used to like James Bond, too. You know, he would get a, you know, a mission from the Queen of England. Okay, the House, the House of Justice, we're getting a mission from the King and not of England. Okay, and it's the same kind of thing. So as a little kid, I always wanted to be that, and now the House of Justice is giving me a chance to fulfill my childhood fantasies. That's what I feel in this. And so your mission also, should you decide to accept it, your mission also, should you decide to accept it, is to take this five-year plan and carry it out because the fate of the world is in our hands. And we talked yesterday about one part of the five-year plan, which was to perfect our inner character through the spiritual requirements, that of a chaste and holy life and a rectitude of conduct and freedom from prejudice. We talked about how our mission, should we decide to accept it, is to become a light in darkness. Just like Baha'u'llah was in the Sea of Shal, which was the darkest spot, we can become a light in darkness. And that really is the first mission that we're told to do. And it's so easy to be a light in darkness because you know light shines very well in darkness. And if you have the qualities, say rectitude of conduct. What are the qualities of a rectitude of conduct, Shoghi Fendi said? They were justice, equity, truthfulness, honesty, fair-mindedness, reliability, trustworthiness. If you have any of these qualities at your work, you're going to shine like a light in darkness, isn't that right? if you're reliable, if you're trustworthy, if you're fair-minded. It's pretty easy to do that. All you really have to do is, first time you go to work or go to school or whatever, just say you're a Baha'i. That's all. Just 
two words, I'm a, three words, I'm a Baha'i. Okay, and then from that point on, every time you're trustworthy or fair-minded or equitable or honest or reliable, every time you do that, you're telling people what the Baha'i faith is like. And it will shine like a light in darkness. And don't be afraid of the dark. Don't say, oh, I want to go with the flow. I want to be like the dark. Because this is what we're called. This is your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to be a light in darkness. The same is true with chastity and purity. Modesty, purity, temperance, decency, clean-mindedness, all the things that Shoghi Effendi said. So easy to be a light in darkness, because if you do any one of these things and you're a youth, you're going to stand out. Believe me, you're going to stand out. And you'll be a light in darkness. You know the horse is one of the few animals that has virtual 360 degree vision. Did you know that? The way the horse's eyes are placed on its head and the shape of its head, it, it only, it has like I think a 350 degree vision. It has a slight blind spot here and a slight blind spot there, but it just does that and it covers that. So it basically can see completely 360 degrees. And so because horses have that kind of vision, they're very good naturally at racing. They run and race themselves. Horses just don't race when men race them, but they, in the wild they race. And this is because they're really good at it because they can see everything that's coming up from behind them just as they're running. They're naturally good at this. So when human beings first started to race horses, they found that this capability of horses was really bad because the jockey couldn't control the horse. So he, they would try to make it move and the horse would make his own move based on what the horse can see. So what's the first thing they did to horses when they tried to race them? They put blinders on them, which basically covered three quarters of their vision. Go and look at those things. They crippled the greatest asset that this wonderful creature has by blinding it so that the jockey could have complete control of the horse and he couldn't see. And we have blinders on us today. The old world, the world we live in, has put blinders on us so it can control us and race us and tell us when to move and when not to move. And these are the blinders of materialism. They're the things that Baha'u'llah calls idle fancies and vain imaginations and superstitions and imitations. These are like blinders. And the House of Justice refers to this concept that we are blinded by what the world puts on us uh, when they talked about chastity and purity. And they did a little tricky little thing here. I like what they did. Because Shoghi Effendi said, uh, chastity and purity concerns the Baha'i youth principally. Later on he said it concerns everybody, but it concerns the Baha'i youth principally. And the House of Justice, when they referred to it in their 28 December message, they brought it back to the adults. In other words, they didn't want adults to say, oh, that's just for the youth. And they said this. They said, the forces at work on the hearts and minds of the young to whom the guardian directed his appeal most fervently are pernicious indeed. Then they said this, exhortations to remain pure and chaste will only succeed to a limited degree in helping them to resist these forces. So exhorting the youth to do this will not succeed very much, only to a limited degree. They said what needs to be appreciated in this respect is the extent to which young minds are affected by the choices their parents make for their own lives when no matter how unintentionally, no matter how innocently, such choices condone the passions of the world. Now this is very interesting because what basically they're saying is that we as parents and adults, we condone the passions of the world around us. We do it innocently and we do it unintentionally, but we condone them. And by condoning them, it makes it almost impossible for our young people to accept chastity and purity. And then they list six passions of the world that we condone. And we should memorize those six because those six to me are the six blinders that the jockey of the world is put on us and trying to whip and ride us. We should say these things are blinders we must take off. So let's see what those six are. The first they said, the first passion of the world which we condone and we unintentionally and innocently uh, carry out is one admiration for power. That's one of the passions of the world, 
admiration for power. They're linking this to chastity and purity. The second, they said, is the world's adoration of status. And think about that, adoration of status. The third, they said, is the world's love of luxuries. You'd agree that's another one, isn't it? The fourth, they said, it's attachment to frivolous pursuits. Frivolous pursuits. The fifth, it's glorification of violence. And the sixth, it's obsession with self-gratification. Now, as we as adults, or anyone, if we condone these, then we are unwittingly making it impossible for the youth and the future generations to carry out the laws. And these are the blinders we need to take off. As I read these six, no, you can, it's in the House of Justice message, but as I read these six, the first thing I read is I said, this is a great list for any Hollywood film producer or television producer. <laughs> these are the big six that you can base all of your entertainment on. Think of every movie, every TV show, everything you have, and they're built on this. I'll read them again, and you think now about every movie and every TV show and see if they don't have one or two or three or four, even all six of these. Admiration for power. Adoration of status. Love of luxuries. Attachment to frivolous pursuits. Glorification of violence. Obsession with self-gratification. Every time we turn on the television, every time we go and sit in a movie theater, these things are embedded in society and ourselves. And the House of Justice is calling our attention to these blinders that the old world order is putting at us. And we're told constantly by Shoghi Effendi that we shouldn't underestimate these things in the world. We think, oh, it's not so bad, I do this, i not so bad, I do that. You know, everyone does it, what's wrong with it? Okay, but underestimating something, the greatest symbol for underestimating anything in science is the iceberg. I don't know if you know this, that an iceberg is the standard scientific principle for underestimating something. We say when something you underestimate, you say that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know if you know this, but the term tip of the iceberg is a scientific, precise formula. Anytime you see any ice floating above water, there's an exact amount of iceberg below it. It has to do with the laws of, of water and its weight in relation to it. So if, you, if an iceberg is that size, there's a formula, and it's about 10 to 1, that there's 10 times as much underneath. There cannot be, it not, cannot be there. If you see you know, that size, if there's a one mile iceberg, there's 10 miles of iceberg underneath because that's the nature of water. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. And this is what it's like. We look at these things and we don't realize how bad they are, how dangerous they are. We underestimate them. Now, there are many things that we can do uh, that can make, a, make us a light in darkness. Definitely rectitude of conduct. Definitely chaste and holy life. Freedom from prejudice is the fastest way you can be a light in darkness here in the South. If you show absolute freedom from prejudice, and I'm not talking about just speaking about it. I'm not talking about just believing it. I'm talking about demonstrating it in your life so that people can see it. Remember, this is what Abdu'l-Baha wanted. 1912, he came to this country, and what did he do? He wanted intermarriage. In fact, he, he, he facilitated intermarriage in 1912 in America, when in the majority of states it was illegal for those couples to even travel together, let alone stay in the same hotel. That's what he did. At the very beginning, in 1912, you know, he, he didn't, you know, this, what have we gone through in the last 80 years towards the issue of freedom from prejudice? You know, we try to, you know, see if we can have, you know, minorities sit on in the front of the bus or eat at a lunch counter or go to schools or, or you understand? These are little incremental things. al Baha right at the beginning said, no, let's start right at the beginning. Let's intermarry. Isn't that interesting? I remember once I was at a Baha'i conference and it was a big event on race unity that Baha'is organized. An all-day event, there was speaker after speaker, they had, they had uh, non-Baha'i speakers, and it was all on race unity, a big race unity awareness event. And there was this one non-Baha'i who I know who was there, and 
he said to me, this is very interesting, he said, you know, these people can talk all they want, but the only person that can talk, in my opinion, is Jimmy, he said. And he referred to a friend of mine who's married to an African-American. And this was the perspective of a non-Baha'i that I listened. And I thought for a minute, I thought, that's interesting. He, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's seeing the category three, and we're sitting there talking the category two, if you understand what I'm getting at. He said, the only person that has a right to talk is the one that's actually doing it. I'm not saying, and of course, this is a very interesting concept. If we do not actually demonstrate our freedom from prejudice so that people can see, we won't be a light in darkness. And demonstrating it doesn't mean believing it, doesn't mean talking about it, it means actually doing it in whatever way we can. Another way we can be a light in darkness in America, one of the best ways, is to shine our light where America is darkest. And where is America darkest, according to Shoghi Fendi? It's in politics. Shoghi Fendi said America is the most politically corrupt nation. We talked about this yesterday. And if we could truly become free from politics, then we would be a tremendous light that will shine in darkness. And this is becoming and will become the greatest darkness in American nation because there's greater and greater disillusionment with the political disintegration of this country. A lot of Baha'is don't realize the extent to which we need to be free from politics. Let me read you something what uh, Shoghi Fendi said. We should, every one of us, remain aloof in heart and in mind, in words and in deeds. Okay, we don't just not join a party. We have to be aloof in our hearts and in our minds, in words and deeds from political affairs and disputes of the nations. We should keep ourselves away from such thoughts. We should have no political connection with any of the parties. And he goes on and on like this. In one place, Shoghi Fendi says we should shun politics like the plague. He used the term plague, shun politics like the plague. It's interesting that he compared politics to the plague. You know, if someone has the plague, you don't go near it. <laughs> you go to someone's house and they have the plague, you know, you don't even spend time with them, do you? I mean, it hasn't happened recently, but you just wouldn't do it because you don't even want to touch it. You don't want to go near it. And Shoghi Effendi said, that's what we should think of politics like. You listen, you hear, someone's talking about it. It seeps right into us and infects us. That's what it does. You watch it on TV, you hear someone talking. We should shun it like the plague. Abdu'l-Bahá wrote a letter to one of the believers, and I want to read that to you. He wrote, O handmaid of the Lord, speak thou no word of politics. Thy task concerneth the life of the soul, for this verily leadeth to man's joy in the world of God. Except to speak well of them, make thou no mention of the earth's kings and the worldly governments thereof. Rather, confine thine utterance to spreading the blissful tidings of the kingdom of God and demonstrating the influence of the word of God and the holiness of the cause of God. And I really think it's a shame that the American Baha'is sometimes don't always take advantage of this darkness and shine their light. I find the American Baha'is can sometimes get caught up in politics in various ways. They talk about it, even with their non-Baha'i friends. They absorb many of the characteristics of political discourse into their Baha'i communities. I hate to say it, because it's a shame. This is a darkness which we're given in order to shine our light. It's as if they've turned off all the lights and now we can shine a projector on the screen. We should think about this. That's what politics does. And particularly now that we're coming into a political season, which we get every four years now, and all that really happens is that one party stands up and says, the other party's been robbing and cheating you for years. Now give us a chance. <laughs> and that's all it is. It is never going to change. So, so let's just get this right. All they're trying to do is decide who gets to be captain of the Titanic? <laughs> That's all it is. 
and it's already hit the iceberg. It's going down, and they're still fighting to see who gets to be captain. We don't need to worry about this. Baha'u'llah said the old world order is going to be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. We don't have to worry about that old world order. It's going to be rolled up. You know, you know when you stay in hotels, don't you just love it when you leave and you don't have to make the bed? <laughs> Isn't that fun? You know you don't have to worry about it because the maid's going to come in and roll it up. And so why worry about it? Why worry about politics? Baha'u'llah says it's lamentably defective. And so this is an area where we can really shine like a light in darkness. Now, when I think about the five-year plan, it gives me such a vision of the future of mankind, the future of humanity. And if you really want to clearly know the future of mankind, you really want to see the future, you can do so by reading the Kitab i -Aktas. The Kitab i -Aktas is the clearest way to see the future of mankind. Because if you look at the laws in the Kitab i -Aktas, and imagine we'll be obeying this law and that one, you can envisage the whole future of mankind better than any science fiction novel, better than any sociologist or historian can foresee, the Katabi Aktas is the clearest vision of the future of humanity. And so whenever I see a law in the Katabi Aktas and think about the future and then see some connection to that, to what we're doing in the five-year plan, I get excited because I feel a connection to the future with what I'm doing here today in the five-year plan. For example, I read in the Kitab i Aktas a very interesting passage. Baha'u'llah says, Teach your children the verses revealed from the heaven of majesty and power, so that in most melodious tones they may recite the tablets of the All-Merciful in the alcoves of the Mashrikalaz cars. And when I first read this, I said, Oh my gosh, I can see the future of humanity. Baha'u'llah is commanding every parent to teach every child to sing the word of God in the Mashrikalaskas. I mean, what parent is not going to do it when there are temples in every city in the world? They're all going to do it. That means that in the future, every single human being from the earliest age will sing and the word of God will sink deep in their hearts because whatever we sing as a child, we never forget. <laughs> We're going to have great choirs. <laughs> because everybody knows from musical studies that when children sing, they become musical adults. And so I can see some of the future just in this one sentence. That in the future, every little child will go into that temple and sing the word of God and how this will transform and affect society. So, so this is just one little sentence. And you could take any sentence and do the same thing. Another interesting thing is the actual institution of the Mashra Kalaskar itself, which is one of the great laws of the Kitab i -Aktas. And we know that every single city will have these houses of worship. They'll be the center of the city. And Adubaha says that every morning, everyone will gather together for communal worship in these temples. And surrounding them will be all these institutions for social and economic progress. And this is a wonderful way to think about the future of mankind. But then you might say, well, that's just for the future. What about today? We only have a few temples in a few spots on earth. And this is very interesting. Because in 1999, December 28, 1999, the Universal House of Justice sent a message. And it was very interesting. They talked about the law in the Kitab i Aktas of the Mashrik Alaska. And they said, we can fulfill this law even today. We only have temples in seven spots on the earth right now, but we can still fulfill that law today. Let me read you what they wrote. They say, the spiritual growth generated by individual devotions is reinforced by loving association among the friends in every locality, by worship as a community, and by service to the faith to one's fellow human beings. These communal aspects of the godly life relate to the law of the Mashrikalaskar, which appears in the Kitab i -Aktas. Although the time has not come for the building of local Mashrikalaskars, the holding of regular meetings for worship open to all, 
and the involvement of Baha'i communities in projects of humanitarian service are expressions of this element of Baha'i life and a further step in the implementation of the law of God. And so I read this and I say, oh my gosh, our devotional gatherings are the Mashvakalaskar. We can fulfill the law of the Mashvakalaskar in the Akdas in our devotional gatherings. Our devotional gatherings are the seeds of the future. They fulfill this mighty law of God at this time, along with our acts of service and humanitarian projects. Now when I see this, I realize, of course, the Mashvakalaskar is not the building. The building is just the physical expression of the attitude of communal worship. We, we should have known this in 1912 when Adabaha came to Chicago and he put one rock on the ground and said, the temple is already built. And the architect said, well, you could have fooled me. <laughs> but, but you see, Adabaha knew. He understood that the building was just a physical expression of communal worship. And so right now, you think you're going to some little meeting with four or five people? No, you're actually founding the future of the human race by instituting this mighty law of the Mashokalaska. That is, the future of mankind is in the Akdas and we are building that future in its very first steps. History will look back and say, this mighty institution was founded in these communities, in these devotional gatherings. So whenever I'm going to my devotional gatherings or I'm going to a service project, I'm going to the Mashokalaskar. I feel a connection to the future, even here and now. Now, another interesting feature of the five-year plan, of this whole 25-year period, is its emphasis on children and junior youth. And this has been greatly stressed many times by the House of Justice. It's very interesting to me because you cannot change the future any easier than you can by teaching children and junior youth. You can't change the future any easier. In fact, you have to always think that when you're teaching children, you're actually teaching adults. You should always remember this. When you're teaching children, you're teaching adults. Because so far, no human being has ever succeeded in remaining a child. <laughs> they all end up as adults. When you're teaching children, you're teaching the adults of the future. Except it's easier to teach the adults of the future than it is to teach the adults of today. I got a real insight into this when, as a Baha'i youth, I was involved in some summer teaching and service projects in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. We'd go up there for several months at a time during the summer, and I don't know if you know this, but the Western Highlands of Papua New Guinea is classified by anthropologists as among the most primitive spots on Earth. Uh, they have some kind of way of classifying cultures and civilizations, you know, by how many words they have in their language, what they do, their technology, and so forth. And they classified this region in terms of one of the most primitive on Earth, or, or at least it was at that time in the 1970s. Not just a few hundred years behind what you or I may know, but in some respects even thousands of years. These are wonderful people, spiritually inclined, they take to the faith, but anthropologists classify their culture and civilization as being, in some respects, thousands of years behind what we know in other parts of the modern world. In fact, I remember that a little time before we got up there, Michael Rockefeller, the, the son of the U.S. Senator, had been up in the Western Highlands, and they think he got eaten by cannibals. No one's really sure, they, they never found his body, but there was this rumor that was going on at the time. So they tell us Baha'i youth, go to the same area where this happened. <laughs> but you know, we weren't afraid that maybe they still perhaps practice cannibalism. Still, you know, when they became Baha'is, one of the first things we impressed upon them was, we're not allowed to have non-Baha'is for feast. <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't scared or anything, but I tried to tell a lot of jokes because I'd heard that they don't eat comedians because they think they taste funny. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that they're considered very primitive, thousands of years old in some respects. They're wonderful people, they're spiritual, they embrace the faith quicker than we do, 
but from a social evolutionary viewpoint, they were classified as relatively primitive at the time we were there. Now, one of the years I went up there, they got their independence from Australia and they elected their first prime minister. His name was Michael Samari. And I remember seeing him on the news in Australia. He flew to England and would meet with the Queen. He'd come to Australia and have high-level government meetings. He was very educated, a man of the world, very well spoken, and I was impressed by him. Now, one year when I was up in the Western Highlands, I was in this particular village and I saw a local newspaper. And in it, there was a picture. It had shown Michael Samari and he'd come back for the summer to visit his parents. And his parents looked very much like many of the villagers I was familiar with. And in this picture, I saw this man who I'd seen traveling all around the world on TV, and he had donned the dress of his parents. And when I say donned the dress, he basically took a lot of his clothes off. And I looked at the picture of his parents and him, and I said, oh my gosh, from them to him, from his parents to him, he had gone in one generation thousands of years. I said to myself, how did he do that? In one generation, how could there be such a change, a transformation? I mean, he didn't go through the rise and fall of the Greek civilization and the Roman and the medieval times and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason and the Industrial Revolution or any of the stuff that we went through. He just went thousands of years ahead in a single generation without any apparent difficulty or dislocation. And so I asked some people, I said, what's his history? How did he do that? And they said, well, in the 1940s and 50s, the Australian government and various churches started a few schools, just a few little schools here and there, and he was one of the first students. And then I realized something very interesting. Education, the power of education, can move even in a single generation thousands of years. And something hit me about the power of education. Not just how powerful it is, but how deceptively simple this power is for the advancement of civilization. And this is what I think we're doing in the five-year plan. We're projecting into the future. I mean, I mean, you couldn't take his parents that distance. There's only so much you can do with adults who are already entrenched in their culture and language and customs. And yet with education, in a single generation, with children, you can move ahead by leaps and bounds. We should view our children's classes and junior youth activities just like this. We can impel civilization forward by thousands of years in a single generation. Now, one of the main themes I find in the writings of Shoghi Effendi, and echoed over and over again by the House of Justice, is the concept that there is both a major and a minor plan of God that's going on. Shoghi Effendi explains that the major plan of God is that the world is disintegrating, it's crumbling. The old world is dying, and that's God's job. That's his plan. And the minor plan is our work to build the new civilization, to teach the faith, raise the administrative order, establish the behavior of a new race of men, and so on. And the five-year plan is the minor plan today for us. That's what we're doing to build the Baha'i system, and the major plan is what God is doing to destroy the other system. Now, why does he get the major and we get the minor? I think it's only because it's his job and we have our job. So he gets the major, but they both have to be done. And he gets that one and we don't have to help him with that. He's doing very well at it, thank you very much. But this is our job and we have to do that. And I like this concept. Shoghi Fendi draws our attention to it many, many times. And the reason I think I like it is that it gives me a sense that God is interacting with mankind. We don't have so much of that in modern society. When we read old books, ancient history, the Old Testament and so on, God is always smiting people and scourging them and blessing them and choosing them. I mean, God is really rolling up his sleeves and doing things in the world, right? And in this modern world, we don't always have the sense that God is interacting with mankind. But when you read Shoghi Effendi in the House of Justice, you get the feeling that God is right here and he's doing things. And so I like to think of the major plan like this. Anytime I see anything going on in the world, anything going wrong, any kind of downfall or disintegration, 
I just say to myself, major plan of God. <laughs> That's what I say. I say, major plan of God. I turn on the news today and they say, you know, some war broke out. I say, major plan of God. <laughs> I hear on the news that say the stock market crashed and the economy is in the dumpster. I say, major plan of God. I turn on the news and I hear that some nation was overturned in a revolution that no one could foresee. I say, major plan of God. I don't care what happens. I could turn on the news tomorrow and they could say that earthquakes and plagues and floods and another world war, whatever. I'll just say, major plan of God. I mean, that's all I'm going to say. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's his job. And whatever happens in the world, that's the major plan of God. What we have to do is concentrate on our job. And that's the minor plan of God. But the interesting thing is, is that Shoghi Fendi says that these two plans, they act in synchronization. That's the exact word he used. They act in synchronization. In other words, they go together, hand in hand. And when I read the way Shoghi Fendi talks about this, and we'll read some of these quotations, I get the impression that the major plan and the minor plan of God are like a rowboat with two oars. God's got one oar and he's rowing, and we, the Baha'is, we have the other oar. And as you know, in a rowboat, if you're not in perfect synchronization, the rowboat doesn't go forward. It turns to the left or the right or something. They have to be in sync. They have to be at the same time and they have to be of equal strength. We know this. Have you ever tried to row a boat and not be in sync? It's terrible. This is what I think the major and minor plan of God is like. And sometimes I think God decides he wants to row a little harder. He says, I'm going to row a little harder now. I'm going to do a world war or a revolution or something, you know, and he's going to row a little harder. And so he turns to us and he says, you got to row a little harder right now too, because as I row harder, you have to row harder. And you can see, every time there's been something coming in the world, the head of the faith will tell us we've got to do something. We have to act very quickly. And I think it's because of this synchronization. Adubaha, when he wrote the Tablets of the Divine Plan during the First World War, he referred to the bodies on the battlefield and the suffering and the turmoil. Go look at the prayers and other passages in the Tablets. He related the Tablets of the Divine Plan and the mission the Baha'is had to carry out to the suffering and the turmoil of World War I. Shoghi Effendi wrote the Advent of Divine Justice eight months before the beginning of World War II. Just eight months before the war. I'm going to read to you what Shoghi Fendi wrote about this major and minor plan. And I want you to think about this very carefully. What I'm going to read to you now was written eight months before the greatest war the world had ever seen. Seventy million people were to die. But it was eight months before. Shoghi Fendi wrote it to tell the Baha'is what to do. It's fascinating when you think of it in hindsight. So I want you to listen to this. And imagine, you're an American Baha'i, and in seven or eight months, this war is going to break out. And this is what you get from Shoghi Effendi. And of course, remember, Shoghi Effendi wrote the advent of divine justice from Europe. As we know, Shoghi Effendi spent a whole year in Europe during that period because it was unsafe in the Holy Land. And there in Switzerland, where virtually with a good pair of binoculars, you could almost see Germany or Poland or whatever, from that spot he wrote this. And here's what he said. Who knows but that these few remaining fast fleeting years may not be pregnant with events of unimaginable magnitude, with ordeals more severe than any that humanity has yet experienced, with conflicts more devastating than any which have preceded them. Dangers, however sinister, must at no time dim the radiance of their newborn faith. Strife and confusion, however bewildering, must never befog their vision. Tribulations, however afflictive, must never shatter their resolve. Denunciations, however clamorous, 
must never sap their loyalty. Upheavals, however cataclysmic, must never deflect their course. The present plan, embodying the budding hopes of a departed master, must be pursued, relentlessly pursued, whatever may befall them in the future, however distracting the crises that may agitate their country or the world. Far from yielding in their resolve, far from growing oblivious of their task, they should at no time, however much buffeted by circumstances, forget that the synchronization of such world-shaking crises with the progressive unfoldment and fruition of their divinely appointed task is itself the work of providence, the design of an inscrutable wisdom, and the purpose of an all-compelling will, a will that directs and controls in its own mysterious way both the fortunes of the faith and the destinies of men. Such simultaneous processes of rise and fall, of integration and of disintegration, of order and chaos, with their continuous and reciprocal reactions on each other, are but aspects of a greater plan, one and indivisible, whose source is God, whose author is Baha'u'llah, the theater of whose operations is the entire planet, and whose ultimate objectives are the unity of the human race and the peace of all mankind. Now, can you imagine how this paragraph sustained the Baha'is during the Second World War? They must have gone back to it over and over again and read it during the war and realized this is what's happening. These two processes are happening simultaneously. And I believe we may need this paragraph in coming years. We're going to need it. We're going to need to understand it, that when God starts rowing that oar harder, the only response is to start rowing this oar harder. That's the only response we should have. And our first response, your mission, should you decide to accept it, <laughs> okay, your mission is to first of all carry out the plan, and secondly, carry out personal transformation. That's the twofold mission we were talking about yesterday. Or should I have said it the other way around? First of all, personal transformation, and secondly, carry out the plan. Okay, since one is a prerequisite. But you have to do them both. We must do both, otherwise it just doesn't work. It's a false dichotomy to say we only want to develop our personal character and not carry out the plan. It's just as bad to say I'm going to work on the plan and worry about my character later. We have to do both. Now, how do we affect personal transformation? since this is part of our mission. And there are many things in the Baha'i writings that give us clues as to how we can change. How many of you would really like to have personal transformation? One, two, three, good. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. But how many of you really know how to do it? You think there's a clear path? Hmm. It's much harder. The writings give us clues. And so we're going to talk about this in great detail in future sessions. Because in this course, we're going to spend one whole day on rectitude of conduct, one whole day on chastity and purity, and a whole day on freedom from prejudice. And we're not going to do category two. I mean, we're not going to try and convince you that it's good to be chaste and pure. I'm not going to try and convince you that it's good to be free from prejudice. You already know that. What we need to do is to study how to do it. Okay, we want to learn how to be category three, and those clues are in the Baha'i writings. And so I can't cover that today, but this is really important. We need to know how to do these things. But I'd like to mention just a few clues that I find to be general principles about how to affect personal transformation. One of these clues comes from a statement from Abdu'l Baha in which he says, personal transformation is achieved through gradual but daily regular progress. And he says this, 
Every day in the morning when arising, you should compare today with yesterday and see in what condition you are. If you see your belief is stronger and your heart more occupied with God and your love increased and your freedom from the world greater, then thank God and ask for the increase of these qualities. Isn't that interesting? Basically, you're not trying to do anything except beat yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just try and beat yesterday. You don't have to worry about how far you have to go, how bad you are. <laughs> okay, you don't have to think about that. You don't have to compare yourself to other people, how good they are and so on. You only have to compare yourself to your own self yesterday and beat yesterday. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't matter how far you have to go as long as you're moving in that direction. If you killed 10 people yesterday, <laughs> try to kill nine people today. <laughs> now you're laughing, but in 10 days you wouldn't kill anybody. You'd save a lot of people. <laughs> and remember, there, there are a lot of people who are killing and doing all kinds of things who have to make this kind of progress. Sure, you understand. And we can't just say, I want to be perfect tomorrow. This is a very important thing, that you make a little progress every single day. A very important principle. Look how it works in the 12-step program, for example, one day at a time. And Abdu'l-Baha understood this. So, that's one important principle. And another principle we find in the writings of Shoghi Effendi, he says that if you want to have personal transformation, you have to have a plan. You can't just do it. You have to have a plan. He even said that Baha'u'llah had plans, Abdu'l-Baha had plans, Shoghi Effendi had plans. So how do we expect to achieve things without plans? This is what he said in a letter on behalf of the Guardian. And this is very interesting because if you make a plan, if you see something and work towards it, you achieve it. If you don't aim for something, you don't get anywhere. And so this is another principle that we're going to talk about a lot in future sessions. Another general principle is that there are six things that the House of Justice identifies as essential to our spiritual growth. This came in one or two letters they wrote to the Baha'is of Europe during the 1980s in which they talked about spirituality and they said spirituality is achieved through the practice of six things. And as I recall, I think the first one was the recital each day of one of the obligatory prayers. And the second, I think they said, was regular reading of the sacred scriptures, specifically at least every morning and evening. The third, they said was prayerful meditation on the teachings. And it's interesting, these first three are all different. The obligatory prayers are one thing, reading the sacred scriptures is another, and meditation on the teachings is yet a different thing. And those were the first three. And the fourth was, I believe, striving to bring our behavior into accordance with the high standards and teachings in the faith. The fifth was teaching the cause. Teaching was the fifth thing that is essential to our spiritual growth. And the last one was selfless service to the work of the cause and also uh, service in carrying out our trades and professions. And they said we need to do all six of these. These are the big six of your life. And I firmly believe that if anybody took just that one letter of the house and said, I'm going to do these six every single day, they would undoubtedly develop spiritually, kind of like the minimum daily requirements of spiritual growth. Shoghi Effendi said that achieving progress spiritually means you have to keep moving forward, that you can't stand still. In one letter he says that life is a constant struggle and it's like rowing upstream. And he says, when you row upstream, any time you rest on your oars, you go downstream. Isn't that interesting? You can't rest on your oars, but as long as you're rowing, you're going to get there. And so in these six things, we just need to keep rowing. 
Another principle I find in the Baha'i writings about transformation is that we're told that transformation of the human individual can be achieved through interaction and unity with the community. It's a very important principle. Because for a long time in religion, people thought that they could transform themselves independent of service and interaction with the community. They thought they could go and live in a monastery or live in caves or be darvishes or something like that. And we're told in the Baha'i writings that this is not possible. The days when idol worship was deemed sufficient are ended. Now we need service and deeds and so on. And there's a principle in the Baha'i writings, and I see it in the House of Justice messages, that your spiritual transformation is tied up to your unification with other human beings. That there are things that will transform you in unity with other people that you just can't get in other ways. This is an important principle in science, actually in all of physical creation, that transformation of elements is achieved through unity. In all physical creation, the atoms combine and they make molecules. As we talked about it the other day, there are only 92 natural elements in physical creation. And you say, well, how can we make up the whole universe with just 92 elements? Well, that's because the 92 atoms, the elements, are like letters. And then molecules are like words. And so you say, well, we only have 26 letters, but how many words do we have? You understand. And so that's how it is. And the thing is this, is that when these letters come together, they make words. So letters, in a way, are transformed into a greater thing when they become united with others to form a word. The letter B means one thing, but when united within a word, it takes on a new characteristic. So also is it in physical creation. Physical elements are completely changed and transformed simply by uniting and bonding with other elements. Let's look at something very simple, hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest, most basic element in the universe. Really, the first element that existed. And hydrogen, we know, is extremely flammable. We associate it with flame and fire. Ask anyone on the Hindenburg as they were landing. <laughs> They'll tell you, hydrogen is really flammable. In fact, look at the sun. The sun, it's just burning hydrogen. Hydrogen is the mother of all fires, the most basic flammable element. Another element, another basic atom that we associate with fire, of course, is oxygen. As you know, on Earth, fire can't live without oxygen. You know this. If you take oxygen away, the fire goes out. You smother the fire, take away its oxygen, the fire goes out. That's why a light bulb is in a bulb. They take all the oxygen out and it doesn't start a fire inside. That's the principle. So, we have these two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, and both are intimately related to fire. But you take these two elements and unite them in a bond. And it so happens that hydrogen and oxygen form a very special tight bond, a very interesting, unique bond. You can see it in pictures, I'd love to show it to you and you bond them together, and it creates water. And you say, hold on, wait a minute. If you'd asked me, don't ever put hydrogen and oxygen together. <laughs> Those two things, man, if you get them together, they're gonna burn us all to death. And you put them together, and they bond, and now they still retain their identity. But when they bond, they create water, which puts out fire and has all kinds of characteristics that neither hydrogen nor oxygen had on its own. Because unity is a very interesting thing. Unity causes transformation of physical elements. And it's exactly the same with us in our lives. That when you unify with somebody, you may be hydrogen and they may be oxygen. And people say, don't put those two together. But you put them together and you form a bond and it creates something that didn't exist, as wonderful and as life-giving as water. And so there's transformation through unity. And this is why I believe the House of Justice is stressing the importance of community as one of the three pillars upon which society stands. 
They say the institutions have to evolve, the individuals have to evolve, and the third, the community has to evolve. And the community creates this unity which will cause our transformation. And if you don't participate in the unity of the community, the loving fellowship that takes place in all of our activities, you're missing out on a tremendous amount of transformation that you cannot achieve otherwise. D don't think you can go home and perfect your character alone without having the transformation that community can give you. And we're going to talk about this in great detail in future sessions. Now, there's an interesting point that Hooper Dunbar recently made at a Baha'i Studies Conference in Vancouver. And he said that all of physical creation reflects the attributes of God. We know this. And humans reflect the attributes of God to a greater extent than anything in physical creation. And one of the attributes of God in the writings is the unique one. God is the unique one. And this is interesting. How does physical creation, as well as man, reflect this attribute? Perhaps we think that it's only for God to be unique. But in the world, we know that everything is unique. Every snowflake is unique, every plant, every human, every DNA, every fingerprint, and so forth. God is reflected in his creation. And we are all unique as well, in relation to God and to God's plants. And he said that because of this, we have to understand that we have a role to play in God's plan that is unique. There is a role that you can play, and if you don't play it, nobody else can, because you're unique. It's like you're a puzzle piece that fits in that spot in the plan. And if you don't put yourself in that spot, the puzzle will be incomplete. And every one of us is like this. We've all been chosen. Don't think that you're a Baha'i by accident. He says in the long obligatory prayer, Thy grace hath raised me up and led me unto thee. Who otherwise am I, that I should dare to stand at the gate of the city of thy nearness? You're sitting here today because God has chosen you. And you have a unique role to play. And if you don't play that role, nobody else can. And this doesn't just affect the way in which we think about ourselves. It also affects the way in which we view our fellow Baha'is. That they also have a role to play. And we should treat them, each and every one of them, as if they're vital to everything. You know, like, if you're on a baseball team, you value everyone on the team. You're all on the same team. The right fielder, the first baseman, whoever. They're on our team. We support them. In fact, the best way to serve the cause, as is the example of Abdu'l Baha, is to serve your fellow Baha'is. The best way to serve the faith is to be supportive and encouraging of others. If you just supported yourself, one person gets it. If you support others, hundreds or thousands get it. And then if we're all like that, you get thousands supporting you. And so what we really need to understand is that we have been given a mission, something that we can do for the faith and only we can do it. And right now, that's in the five-year plan. And we shouldn't be deflected by what's going on in the world. We shouldn't worry about what's gonna happen. We have to understand that this is our mission. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to carry out the process of the five-year plan, to understand it, and to transform your own personal life. So, since my time has nearly expired, I'm going to read to you a passage from Baha'u'llah in which he tells us what we should be like, how we should treat ourselves, that we've been given a special privilege. This faith that we've been given is a privilege, and with it, it bestows upon us capacities and bounties and virtues with which we should not be careless we should not take them lightly. He says this, O oh friends, be not careless of the virtues with which ye have been endowed. Neither be neglectful of your high destiny. 
Suffer not your labors to be wasted through the vain imaginations which certain hearts have devised. Ye are the stars of the heaven of understanding, the breeze that stirreth at the break of day, the soft flowing waters upon which must depend the very life of all men, the letters inscribed upon his sacred scroll. With the utmost unity and in a spirit of perfect fellowship, exert yourselves that ye may be enabled to achieve that which beseemeth this day of God. Verily, I say, strife and dissension and whatsoever the mind of man abhorreth are entirely unworthy of his station. Center your energies in the propagation of the faith of God. Whoso is worthy of so high a calling, let him arise and promote it. Whoso is unable, it is his duty to appoint him who will in his stead proclaim this revelation, whose power hath caused the foundations of the mightiest structures to quake, every mountain to be crushed into dust, and every soul to be dumbfounded. Should the greatness of this day be revealed in its fullness, every man would forsake a myriad lives in his longing to partake, though it be for one moment of its great glory. How much more this world and its corruptible treasures. Thank you all very much. <laughs>